What's up, movie world? The original Evil Dead is currently streaming on Netflix, so let's hang out for a movie night. I review movie previews. This is one of my favorite movie franchises ever, especially in the horror genre. I remember renting the first two films from a video store when I was like 13 years old. I automatically became a fan of the series, the director Sam Raimi, and its star, Bruce Campbell. The films are considered classics, so why is there a remake? Is it going to be a bastardization of the original for the sake of an easy reprofit? Or does the first film, which admittedly is an independent, low-budget creation, have room to grow and need to be remade so that the idea can be optimized? The movie truth is waiting within the film, so get your copy of The Evil Dead queued up and get ready to press play in 3, 2, 1. Notice how the Evil Dead just starts. Renaissance Pictures presents, we have the fog, and then the Evil Dead title emerges, and we just get right into the story. There's no starring, directed by, any of that information in the title sequence. It just gets going. And really like this shot a lot. It's pretty creepy and interesting in that it is a low-budget film, so you have to wonder how did they manage to get this shot not being able to afford a crane of any kind. The car in the pond slash swamp, that's a very interesting little notion. Is there a previous story in this area regarding the cabin where the previous occupant tried to get away and that is their car that is just kind of breaking out of the water? Is it the archaeologist linguist who tried to escape, whose voice is later on the tape, and that was his failed attempt at beating the evil force? Notice here that the music is really important. This film is a really great example of sound design. I wanted to do a movie night for this, not only because we have the remake coming out in April of 2013, but because this is a movie that previewed the talent of everyone involved, especially Bruce Campbell and filmmaker Sam Raimi. We really get Raimi at an early age. They're all in their very early 20s, I believe 20, 21, right around that. There was a previous short that they had all made three years before this. This is 1981, and there was a little movie called Within the Woods in 1978, that they scrapped together some funds for and managed to get it playing at a couple theaters here and there in order to raise funding for a bigger project. Their love had been really in the comedy genre, and we can see in Sam Raimi's later work, starting really with Evil Dead 2, and then really going to the max, kind of crazy, in Evil Dead 3, a.k.a. Army of Darkness in that it's the Three Stooges, that slapsticky, very silly, broad comedy kind of style. And this is a hardcore horror movie. It's 1981, so movies like Black Christmas and Halloween and Friday the 13th have ignited this new genre that is profitable. The only reason a certain genre or type of movie kind of explodes is that the audience responds to the first few films that sort of help to create interest in it. And then everyone else in H. Wood decides, okay, it's hot right now, people are going to pay money. Let's just make as many of these as possible so we can get as much money, as much profit as possible until the interest is no longer there and it will fade away. So the life of the slasher film, which starts in the late 70s, 77, 78, with those three big films, Friday the 13th, Halloween, and Black Christmas, really continues till about 1990, 91, reaching its peak in the mid-80s. So in 1981, this is really early, and the tone of the horror movies in those days is one of being extreme, pushing the boundaries, seeing how far you can test the MPAA in terms of their rating, and horror movies that get kind of an X rating, a too extreme rating, and, and are kind of banned or really uh, cause a little bit of controversy, those are the movies that tend to make the most money. Films like Maniac 
and the Prowler. So Evil Dead, while it's really independent, does try to capitalize on that gore. This is a really great shot here. The sound is amazing. As they were driving up, and we have this nice kind of overhead shot. As they're driving up, we start to hear this thudding from a distance. We're about four minutes into the movie, and we get this really nice angle of the bench on the porch, and it's just banging against the wall of the cabin. It seems that it's just the wind that's sort of doing that. Great angle here as we have the moving bench in the foreground and the unknowing soon-to-be victim of the demons reaching for the key, the bench stops in the foreground, very mysteriously, very creepily. That element was in the original Within the Woods short. The banging bench, later on we're going to see a shot of the girl running from the forest that's in the woods, and reaching for the key and the door opens, and the occupant of the house reaches and grabs her arm. There's a, a lot of shots that come from that original short that inspire this, and there's a lot of moments in Evil Dead 2 that come from this that inspire that, because the first 30 minutes of that film are really a remake of the entire movie here, for budgetary reasons. We'll get to the details of Evil Dead 2 in that movie night, but here we're establishing the space, all the elements of the area where the characters are going to be running, where possibly the demons and fear factors are going to be coming from. Here's something that we come back to only once in the film, which is the tool shed, as Ash brings his deceased girlfriend back and he locks her up and he's going to dismember her. A scene that'll be repeated in the second film, and most likely in the remake. Notice the sound design here. It's really important how the sound is one of the major factors when it comes to creating suspense and really kind of raising the hair on the back of our necks and making us afraid. This actress here drawing was in the original short, Within the Woods. She's the survivor at the end. It is available on YouTube if you want to check it out. It goes about 30 minutes. It's a very interesting glimpse into the beginning, the potential of Sam Raimi and everyone involved. And you can also see a really young Bruce Campbell starring in it. Notice how the makeup on her arm here on her hand has changed a little bit the veins are a little bluer the hand is a little grayer as if it's possessed this scene really creeped me out when i first watched it again being a little bit younger and not kind of analyzing movies more experiencing them in the moment and not thinking about the movie magic that's involved in the editing and all the elements that come together to make it notice the drapes in the background blowing the music adding to the fear of the moment and the way that she tears through the papers, so you can imagine there's this added force, this uncontrollable entity that's sort of pushing her to draw this. And then we have the classic, the soon-to-be classic, soon-to-be cliche element of the Cabin in the Woods horror movie as the basement hatch starts to move a little bit. Cut to the next scene, and we have the blender with a red drink of some kind. And that's just a nice little cue, some foreshadowing regarding the blood that we're going to get a lot of in the near future. Ash here is making a toast with his iconic blue shirt that will be drenched in blood soon. Really great shot is it's going to be over her shoulder. They're in the kitchen, and you're going to get the over-the-shoulder shot into the living room and the hatch just pops open. Really awesome, good music, very creepy. The acting in this movie isn't the greatest. It's gonna greatly improve in the second film, but for an independent movie, it is not that bad at all. 
This moment, of course, was referenced in Cabin in the Woods. If you have not seen that movie, the Joss Whedon, Drew Goddard, redefine everything about horror movie homage and challenge to future filmmakers, challenge to the filmmakers of the new Evil Dead. How is the new Evil Dead film going to be better than this original? Why do we want to see it now, and why is it being remade? We'll talk about that in just a little bit. There was a nice Sam Raimi camera angle there. Of course, every camera angle here is a Sam Raimi angle, but the more extreme ones, the more risky angles come to be known as kind of the Sam Raimi touch. So we had the low angle and it was kind of spinning around as if from the point of view of the basement as we see all the characters kind of leaning in and looking. Really interesting choice here to stay on the characters that are in the living room and not follow kind of that jerk character. He kind of acts like a jerk the whole movie, so let's just call him that. Not follow him down the stairs. The reason we're doing this is because Ash leaning his head in to kind of that dark little space is a little bit creepy. We're wondering if some kind of hand's going to reach up and grab him. We're wondering if something's going to pop up. At this point, the cliches of the horror genre haven't really become cliches. The grammar of a new genre is being decided upon, it's being formed, it's being experimented with, and just like any kind of language, you have to play around, you have to figure out what works and what doesn't, what sounds right, what the feel is. So these horror movies of the first five years of the slasher genre, of this kind of extreme bloodier horror film this is an era that really challenges what horror movies of the past were of course before we had dracula and frankenstein and finally in the 60s and 70s with hammer horror from england things got a little bit bloodier a little more challenging we have Dario argento over there in italy so there are a lot of changes and challenges taking place within the genre all over the world and the evil dead is recognizing all that and pushing the boundaries in a lot of ways while at the time it was popular to go with that kind of marketable killer with a modus operandi like how does this person kill people we have michael myers with the big kind of kitchen knife in the mask we have jason Voorhees with the machete and soon to be masked. He doesn't get a mask until part three. He's doing the potato sack in part two and he really isn't in part one. It's recognized early that the most memorable, the most marketable horror characters are the ones that have some kind of gimmick, have a recognizable look. And that's really gonna come into strong focus and kind of a refined assembly line quality when we get to the guy who can kill you in your dreams the doll that's possessed by a killer, this agent from hell with pins on his face that comes out of this box. There's, of course, Leatherface from Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and he, after the first film, kind of disappears, but then comes back into popularity as the sequels start making a lot of money. This is a really great, tense scene, filmed very well, and it's something new at the time. The Evil Dead goes against that momentum of having that marketable killer and makes it just a shapeless, nameless form. That's a spooky moment. That's going to make you jump the first time you're watching it. If you're really paying attention, not texting on your phone, if you're in a theater or at home, the lights are down, and you're really giving your attention, not talking, and allowing yourself to be brought into the moment of the film... That scare is really going to work on you. And just the tension of walking through a creepy, dingy cellar in some old cabin in the woods, it really works. It really has a power to it. We have the best moment of the movie here. We have the inciting incident, fateful decision, where the characters have been established. We know what they're doing. They're just hanging out. Interestingly, it is two couples, and an extra girl. Typically in these situations and in the cabin in the woods, we have, usually it is kind of the nerd extra character, Friday the 13th made this popular, where there's always girlfriends and the boyfriends, 
the couples, and there's kind of the one nerd character who can't get a girl. Evil Dead is interesting in that it is kind of, not necessarily a nerdy girl, but just an extra girl. Usually she'd be able to have some kind of boyfriend, but she doesn't. So the coupling and the uh, the pairs that they have here, it's pretty interesting. It's, it's a little bit going against the grain. The book here looks really interesting because it is very fleshy. It's way less refined than it's going to be in the second film. As they find the recorder, this is what really adds some mythos, gives it kind of that epic, bigger feel to it. There was this previous occupant of the cabin, and he recorded this. This isn't a cliche by any means at the moment in time in 1981. It's a very inventive take on a horror movie. Check out Netflix or YouTube or Hulu, whatever video rental service, on-demand service you can find. By the way, here we have, as they're listening to the tape, another slow kind of Sam Raimi circle around the characters who are listening to this, this tape here. That's a camera angle that the 70s show is going to use later on to really great comedic effect. Everything is visual here in terms of how the characters respond to each other. Ash takes his girlfriend's hand. We have a close-up of the tape player. Of course, we have to have some lightning in the horror movie. The clock in the background. And the time is going to be stopped. These are the moments that, in this genre, in this film series, I really love when they're listening to the tape and the guy starts reciting something and setting up this uneasy, scary situation of, well, I came to this secluded area to translate this book of the dead why does this guy fast forward it here i don't know why he wouldn't just let things be playing so 17 minutes maybe the filmmakers realize that hey we got to speed this up a little bit so let's go ahead and get right to it looking at this today at about 17 minutes it is a pretty cheesy effect when as the words are being said there's some kind of red elevator in the woods reaching the top floor like, what was that that was bubbling out from under the ground? It was cool because it was smoke at first. And then it became some kind of red glowing something. Isn't the force already out there? The movie opens with that Raimi cam, that point of view cam, that Doc Ock and Spider-Man 2 is kind of going to use when we go to the POV of his tentacles. So here it's the evil dead cam. It's the spirit. It's the demon cam. So aren't the demons in the woods, but they need the words to kind of release them into the dimension. Like they can kind of look into our dimension, travel around the woods, but they're not able to enter the characters at the moment. They're not able to manifest themselves into the realm through the human body until the words are spoken. So what is it that's really rising out of the ground? It's a really cool visual. It's really creepy. And it happens quick, and it gives us an uneasy feeling, so it plays more on the emotion than the logic of the moment. And as we're watching this, the tension is rising. We don't really care too much about the logic, but it is something that can and should be addressed in the remake. 
The idea of the remake is to take everything that was great about this film, and by the way, this movie has been remade four times. Before we get into that, let's talk about the most touching and poignant and promising of Sam Raimi's future dramatic career seen in the film. Twenty minutes into the movie, we have Ash holding the pendant, the necklace, in the box on his lap, and we get this really great eye play between the characters. The music is turned a little more sentimental, a little more romantic, and we get that he's toying with his girlfriend here, pretending to be asleep. The heart's on the box. And she gets the pendant that will also return in Evil Dead 2, Dead by Dawn. This was not an element in the first film. Neither was the book. In the Within the wood short, there was no Book of the Dead. The idea was that they were in a sort of cabin in the woods that was near an Indian burial ground. And they disturbed the spirits in the area. They killed... Ash possessed him and then he went into the house and started taking out everybody else. So look at Within the Woods as the first draft of this idea. Look at The Evil Dead as draft number two. Evil Dead 2 Dead by Dawn would be the final draft. There is a mini, mini remake in Army of Darkness when it comes to this story. Bridget Fonda replaces the girlfriend and it's just really summarized very quickly to kind of get the audience up to speed. Evil Dead 2 is 1987, this is 1981. So by 1987, the tone of horror movies had really changed, and it was appropriate for Raimi and company to do more of a comedy, almost spoof, of all the elements of the horror film. It's not necessarily a spoof because it's very inventive, and I think Evil Dead 2 is one of the most inspired creative films ever made we'll get more into that as we go because evil dead here the evil dead the remake is called just evil dead is a straight up hardcore scary go for it bloody horror movie and if you allow yourself to really check it out it is streaming on netflix currently so really recommend turning the lights off having it quiet and really focusing, turning the phone off, don't have the laptop on, just really give yourself to this movie. And you'll find that it does creep you out, it does make you a little bit scared. And there are some great moments that cause you to jump. And if you have a basement, you might think twice about going down there if the lights are turned out. I know in the house that I grew up in, we did have kind of an older looking basement, it was unfinished. And after watching both of these films back to back, it was a little bit suspect to go down there. It was a little bit nerve wracking to go down to the basement for the next couple days because it made you think twice. It kind of gave you the, the chills. This is an absolute stupid character decision, very cliche. We got the cool image of the moon and the foreboding dark smoke covering it. Now, if the moon is covered, wouldn't the light in the scene sort of dissipate a little bit? Wouldn't it become darker? Again, if you have a choice, I suppose, go for the emotional choice over the logical choice. Because we respond first with our emotions. We don't necessarily think about things in the moment. We feel them first. And then later we can go back and say, wow, that really scared me, or it was funny, or it was totally emotional, I was crying, I was laughing, 
But it kind of doesn't make sense now that I'm thinking about it. But in that moment, it really got to me. This is now the most kind of infamous and famous scene of the Evil Dead at the time. And really, up until today, it, it sticks out as kind of the most inventive, left field, what were they thinking idea that just seems to work. We just accept it. I mean, essentially, we're going to watch a character get raped by the forest. That's really kind of pushing the boundaries. We have, of course, I Spit on Your Grave, which comes out in the late 70s. And Wes Craven's Last House on the Left, which aren't afraid to really disgust us with kind of how violent and just horrible the rape is in general. And making us kind of go through it on screen. It's uncomfortable, uneasy, and just kind of just primal terror but here for some reason we accept it in a, in a weird way she goes through all this and let's give the filmmaking a lot of credit notice we're doing the close-ups the sticks obviously the crew are controlling those they're close-ups so we don't really need the extreme special effects it's just sticks on strings we have the crew members kind of holding them the shirts are pre-torn the blood is already under the shirts ready to be shown as soon as they're torn off and this gets really just in your face. It's like, okay, the force is going to spread her legs. It's, it's kind of daring, man. And it's really interesting that it managed to stay in the film. And that the film managed to be shown at the time. But that was kind of the sensibility that was going on. And that these extreme horror films had a big market. And they were being shown. And it wasn't a huge deal. There was some controversy going on. That was kind of the nature of the beast at the time. It'll be interesting to see how this is done in the remake. One of the main elements of this new remake is the idea that it's going to be more extreme. Cabin in the Woods kind of basically told us there's nowhere else to go with a Cabin in the Woods story. So in remaking Evil Dead, the challenge is really like, well... What else can you do with the setup of some teenagers going to a cabin in the woods, going to some kind of location, and they're going to be terrorized by a killer, by a demon, by a force. They find a book. They find some curse. They find a Hellraiser box. They unleash it. And now they have to deal with this ancient, evil, unrelenting enemy. How do they stop it? We've kind of seen it all before, so the challenge is, well, how do you do it? Evil Dead and Evil Dead 2 are really great examples of, okay, Evil Dead sets the standard. Here's what it is, just straight up horror film. And Evil Dead 2 takes it to that new level of, we're going to retell the story. It's going to be a little slicker, but it's also going to be much more creative. And we're going to have a lot more fun with it. But it does have a comedic tone. So we're talking about the story life cycle, the genre life cycle, where just in general... By the way, we're watching the film grammar of the horror movie of the early 80s give us all the future cliches in that she hears a noise outside, right? We have really great sound effects. Join us, which is in the short Within the Woods from 1978. So that was carried over here. And the cliche now is that she goes outside by herself. She doesn't say, oh, guys, hey, by the way. I heard some really creepy demonic voice uh, outside. I haven't had any alcohol. I haven't smoked any pot. There's no reason why I'd be hallucinating. So maybe we should go check it out or maybe get the hell out of here. Or maybe it was just some noise in the woods that I just made sound like that. And notice here that these kids aren't partying. That's something that's been a recent addition. They just kind of showed up, had some dinner, just get together. There's no sort of debauchery going on. They're just kind of hanging out, having a good time. So that's an addition that comes later on, especially in Friday the 13th. That's a franchise that becomes known for the teens wanting to just have fun and kind of being punished for it. So a series of cliches. She leaves the cabin by herself. She goes out. She gets attacked. Then she runs through the woods and falls many times. Then as she gets to the door, the tension of reaching for the keys. 
and that's nothing new. We can go to a movie like When a Stranger Calls, and early in that film, when she's trying to run out of the house as the killer is upstairs, she opens the door and the chain's on the door. So any kind of tension like that just gets us, the audience, to react. And it takes a while for her to find the keys while we're cutting back to the demonic force moving towards the house. And she opens the door, and then a hand reaches out and grabs it. Again, that's the moment that's taken from the original short. And it's Ash, and he brings her in, and she wants to leave. Now, why can't the demonic force possess them now? The words have been spoken. So why is it that it waits? Wouldn't the barrier between dimensions, or whatever rule that force field is kind of established that's stopping the demons from possessing the living. That's a really nice shot right there, by the way, as they're getting into the car in the foreground. We have the three remaining friends standing in the doorway as the light is just beaming from behind them. It looks really cool 30 minutes into the movie. So the logic of what the demons do and why they do it and how they do it isn't really spelled out too much. That's fine. It's a mystery. It's kind of scarier in a way if the rules aren't so clear cut but at the same time it's kind of nice to have some sort of guidelines like this is how you stop them this is how you start them up so kind of pick your horror film etiquette do you want to know how to stop the force or is it scarier and a little more frightening if you don't know how seems like another film from the 70s is going to be a major factor in evil dead the remake in that the exorcist we basically get the main opponent in this new film which is one of the girls that gets possessed if it follows suit here someone in the remake reads through the book the nerd character and unleashes the demons the girl gets possessed and now she kind of looks like the exorcist girl like linda blair and kind of a cross between Linda Blair and maybe like some J-horror, dark-haired, ring, grudge kind of girl. The remake is going to rely heavily on the gore, which is something that really happens here in this movie. So far, we're 32 minutes into the movie, and we haven't had a lot of blood. It's just going to start picking up, and it's just going to keep getting worse and worse. Once it kicks in, it's going to be unrelenting. And that was something that Raimi and Campbell and everyone involved learned from their lessons of going to drive-ins at this time in the late 70s, early 80s, and paying attention to audience reactions when they would watch horror films, double features, kind of B-movie horror films, that had this grindhouse sensibility of kind of this exploitation, just keep pouring on the blood. Don't care too much about the characters and story. Make it bloody, make it sensational. Whatever the element that audiences respond to, exploit it to the nth degree. And let's just make some money. We have the tree fall in the foreground in front of the character who was just violated by the trees so that adds a little bit of a element of fear for us we're expecting that this forest is alive and can attack them but it doesn't at this point so why did it attack her when she was by herself and not at this moment with ash really great shot of the bridge notice how the beams are brought up into a claw-like pose it's very much like a hand like the whole little island mountain kind of area that they're in has this hand and it's kind of gripping them to stay good decision here for the light to be beaming on the characters from the headlights on the car and they're struggling to understand what's going on we have a little crane shot as she's frustrated she can't escape and the axe coming down on the wood 
X, of course, a horror movie element. And we're getting the next phase, the next part of the story from the tapes. Interesting here that it's only Ash that's listening to it. Notice that he has the earpiece. 34 minutes. Wouldn't everyone else be interested in knowing what the F is going on and how can we get out of it? Wouldn't they be talking about it must have been something on the tape? It must have been those words that released this force. And how come this character isn't talking more about being raped by the forest? Why are they playing cards and pretending to do ESP games? There's something missing in terms of the carryover, the follow-through, and the impact of moments on characters and their emotions. This character who just went through this horrible situation, this horrible experience, should be telling everyone, hey, the forest did this to me, and they'd be calling her crazy or whatever, but it should be discussed. This is really a great moment as she starts doing the ESP and she's getting all the cards right and she has that kind of demonic voice and she turns around from the window and now we have the makeup. Really cool how she's being held up. Obviously there's something through the window that's kind of bracing her, but that's a very inventive visual. The makeup's interesting. There was a story about the contacts that they had to put on that made them look like they didn't have any eyes. They were extremely thick and didn't allow the eyes to breathe, so they could be only be worn at 10 minutes at a time. Bruce Campbell described them as Tupperware on the eyes. A horror movie element soon to be cliche is that anytime a character seems like they're dead, the other characters come in close to check. And of course... The suspected monster, Possess E, is going to jump at them and attack them. This again, the main reference that we have for any kind of movie like this, Possession, Demons, would be The Exorcist and The Omen. Those are kind of the two big ones at the time. So this is definitely a step up from The Exorcist as we have the vomit and the violence and the vulgarities in The Exorcist, but kind of arts tastefully done this is a little more in your face it's almost 10 years later so it's definitely going to be upping the ante and getting a little bit more ruthless with these elements so imagine the exorcist attacking everyone with a pencil now when she stabs the other female character in the ankle i remember watching that and that was just bloody the makeup here and everything all the effects they're practical which is something that the new film, the remake, is going to be doing. No CGI, which is, we should really praise it for because any kind of CGI blood and all that, it looks just too cheesy. There's something to be said for practical effects. Especially here, even though they're not the greatest special effects, Rick Baker did not do these effects, unfortunately. There's an element to them, because they are kind of slipshoddy and kind of crappy, you can kind of tell that there's the actor's hand under it and this stuff is just barely holding on. It's it's very just amateurish, low budget, right? You know, what are they doing? They, they don't have a lot of money. Another shot of the black smoke covering the moon. We have to ask again, if it does that, wouldn't everything else around it get dark? Because they're in the woods and the main source of light would be the moonlight. As the possessed demon girl is thrown into the basement... Ash now comes and checks in on his girlfriend who was stabbed with the pencil. We have some moonlight on half of her face. Now you could say that's a nice artsy shot in that she's halfway towards becoming a demon. She's still a little bit human because there's light on her face, but then she's half cast in darkness. So that means that there is something within her taking over. Really great shot here as we have the point of view of the demon under in the basement looking out raising the hatch up low angle looking at the characters and it just sticks with this point of view very creepy very unsettling just really good horror movie making and there isn't a movie that's comparable to this at the time the evil dead is really setting a new kind of standard a new 
angle to take when it comes to scaring people. Of course, you had movies like House on Haunted Hill back in the day. But nothing to kind of this extreme with the gore. Characters starting to snap. Really great shot here of the deteriorating flesh of this character and how she's just in the basement. Now we cut back to the demon cam in the forest. I guess the way they did that would just be to have a camera on a long wooden plank, like a 2x4 or something. And it kind of allows for a little smoother movement and allows them to run through. There is no steady cam for them at this time, so they're kind of having to invent their own sort of demon steady cam here. And that's why earlier there wasn't a ripple effect in the water in the opening scene. I always wondered that. How did they get that shot? They don't have a lot of money. It's not a cameraman walking through the water there because there would be ripples. There'd be some kind of wake. But if you have a long enough wooden plank, it's kind of way out in front of any of those ripples. And keep noticing the filmmaking here. The editing is done by the Coen brothers. Raimi became friends with them. As in the early 80s, they were in Detroit editing. And Raimi decided to go there to complete the film, formed a friendship with them. And they would all collaborate on the next film, which would be Crime Wave, which isn't a big hit. And Raimi, kind of fearing for his future filmmaking life, goes back to Evil Dead in 87. So he really makes three films, three major films as the director in six years. He doesn't have a very extensive resume. After Evil Dead, he does Darkman in 1990, Army of Darkness. He acts in some films here and there. He produces a lot. Of course, with his producing partner, Rob Tappert, they create Hercules. So they're very active in the 90s, but as a director, he really tries his hand at a lot of genres. Quick and the Dead, A Simple Plan, which is just a really great dramatic film. If you're any kind of genre director, one of my recommendations, of course, for Michael Bay is make a serious drama. Make a simple plan, then make Transformers. Make a simple plan, then make Spider-Man. It's only the practice of making movies like that for love of the game Sam Raimi did right before Spider-Man. So he starts making these very genre movies to kind of stretch himself. To test himself out, to improve his cinematic fluency with different styles. Here we have the dingy bathroom, which of course is remade in the new film. And it's going to be glossier and shinier. The new movie looks really great in terms of just cinematography and the quality of its film. But what really works in this movie here is kind of the low budget dinginess, the crappy effects, the makeup that you can tell is fake, but it's so overly fake, it's just over the top and it's just uneasy. Love how she attacks him and starts kind of scraping his face. And the blood, it's just, you could tell it's not blood, but it, it's just really uneasy. We have the demon in the basement banging on that hatch. And just the chaos just going forth. And the voices, the manipulation of the voices with the makeup, with the sound effects, with the score all come together and just create that uneasiness. It's a really great example in small budget filmmaking. The effort, and here we have a moment that is gonna be remade in the new film. When the demon's attacking one of the characters, she kinda of hunches over him. And in the new movie, we're gonna have kind of this river of blood, which is sort of taken from a moment later in the movie here as Ash decapitates one of the demons and it starts just like spouting blood from its neck all over Ash. Also combine that with a lot of the bloody comedic moments in part two where the blood's kind of pouring forth from the wall 
and it really is just that over-the-top blood just pushing it as far as possible look at the face here oh just the makeup is so crappy but at the same time here at 44 minutes as he's pulling the knife out from his back and he's gonna stab the one-time friend now demon and cut off the hand it's really ah, oh, it's really starting to get bloody and gory notice the makeup is the skin is turned blue the gray the veins very cool design on the knife by the way and Ash as the main character really starts to take form here the demon is biting her hand off <laughs> and it looks you could tell it's not real obviously you can tell that it's this kind of rubber hand but you're in the moment of the film and you're believing it you're not thinking it's very emotional it's very visceral and it's just uh, extreme it's extreme and that's kind of what this was about look at the face the makeup's torn up close-up of Ash's reaction is a reflection of us in the audience and our reaction this is a bloody movie you know it's it's bloody enough and that's what this new movie is picking up on the remake now notice the smoke coming through the skull mouth on the knife this is some logic that isn't necessarily explained because you have the book which brings forth the demons and you have the dagger which is kind of almost like this ritualistic if it kills the people who have the demons in them it expels the demon why did the smoke just come out of the skull mouth oh and then anything that kind of looks like food right now we have like vomiting of the milk from kind of all over the place the mouth the arm this is bloody man this is hardcore now go back about 30 years and this is really new it's something different <laughs> it's just extreme it's it's very unsettling. I remember watching this and just being uh, grossed out. So the new movie's going for this kind of an angle. Everything, of course, will look nicer. It'll all be practical effects, which again is great. But just because it looks nice and you have kind of a more refined, younger cast and more resources, the budget's going to be ten times of what this was doesn't make it a better movie why do we want to see this new evil dead because we're a fan of the franchise because Campbell and Raimi have given their blessing their producers on the new movie but what else does it need to say about this whole idea of cabin in the woods horror can we really be scared or are we going more out of curiosity I think that it's the curiosity that is the new factor if a remake is made of a favorite film of a classic film we want to go nowadays because of the curiosity what did they do how did it come out now, I'm a fan of any film that has creativity and inspiration and energy behind it this is an amazing shot right here in that the <laughs> Ash's buddy here has just decided to go crazy with the axe and dismember this demon as was recommended on the tape that Ash listened to though he only listened to the part of how to stop the demon not everyone else and they didn't talk about it so there was a logic issue there but we don't care because our emotions are really being tested and and just pushed to the limits notice the clock here at the edge of the screen as it's still holding the time it was at when the clock froze when the girl was writing and drawing in her book and her hand kind of got possessed there hand possession will be something that becomes a big factor in Evil Dead 2 and that's inspired by another short that this circle of friends did called Attack of Hamburger Helper Hamburger Helper being a commercial little character for that brand name and they kind of did a twisted spoof on that so look up Attack of Hamburger Helper on YouTube it's about five minutes and you'll see a lot of Evil Dead 2, Ash's hand gets possessed. Inspiration in that. I'm not against remakes, reboots, and sequels. The rule for me is that they have to be good. And what does good mean? They have to be inspired. They have to be born from some kind of creative energy. They can't just be a go-by-the-numbers, let's just churn it out because there's still money to be made from these ideas. Evil Dead 2, while it's a remake of this film, it goes beyond it. It remakes this one in the first 30 minutes, and it takes the 
ideas here in a, such a new direction that it has so much joy and energy. Evil Dead 2 has to be at the top of the list of films of all time. It literally has a pulse to it. literally has a strong, vibrant life force within it. I mean, you could just tell that they had a good time making that movie. They were just pouring it all out. They were starting to reach their creative uh, momentum, the flow. It's like a runner in a marathon. They're kind of entering mile six and seven, just starting to get the rhythm. They're really feeling it. And now it's like, yeah, the, their career marathon begins and, and let it flow because it's time. It's time to just have an outpouring of creativity and projects and let's just really hit it hard. Really cool animation here at 51 minutes as Ash checks on his girlfriend's foot. The wound mark just kind of starts to spread in this animation. And then she opens her eyes and she's got the crappy contacts. Love the pitch black moment here. This is taken from the short within the woods. Female character, same situation, opens the door. Literally pitch black outside. And there's enough space on the screen that you know... A character is going to pop out of nowhere and give us a little bit of a jolt. Really like this. It's not expected that his girlfriend, Demon, is sitting on the floor and kind of giggling. This gives us a hint that each demon, each entity, has its own personality. And that's super creepy. She's basically just got, like, clown makeup on or just super extreme psycho girlfriend makeup on her body hasn't really changed all of her flesh remains kind of the same color as a normal healthy human the only thing that's really different is that she doesn't have the pupils and she's just got this weird blue rouge kind of makeup going on her face and she has a very possessed kind of expression very uh, uneasy expression and, and the noises that she's making. His friends all messed up. That's kind of a cliche where the one friend, I'm getting out of here, leaving everyone behind. I'm going to go into the woods. Love how they're manipulating the voice of the demon stuck in the basement as she's yelling at Ash. Just those little tweaks on the voices, which you can pick that up from The Exorcist, and that here's this kind of clashing of content you have a young girl who should have a very petite, soft voice. And whenever she speaks, it's this twisted, kind of demonic, anguished voice. Great acting here by the actress playing the demon in the basement. And here we have the twisted, psycho, clown makeup girl. Now Ash is surrounded on all sides. This is when he starts to become the main character of the franchise. He isn't an iconic character yet, where at 53 minutes he starts slapping the demon around a little bit, telling her to shut up. The mental torture is interesting. And notice the simple cuts here. We cut to the close-up of the demon sitting on the floor. We have a close-up of the friend who is mortally wounded, and we have his bones broken, his blood's pouring out of his mouth, and then we cut to a close-up of the demon 
in the basement. It's sound design, it's close-ups for emotional reactions, it's the, the creepiness of the setting, it's the effects of the wind outside. All this is coming together. Really cool trick here in that now she's returned to her human form and Ash is so willing to just drop the gun and accept her. So the toying nature of the evil. Movies that deal with possession are really interesting in that they differ from the slasher film because in the slasher film you just have the one character who was the killer and you have to be on the run from him. But in a movie like this, the idea is interesting in that anyone can become an agent of the killer. The sound of the girl in the basement with the hatch closed, super scary, nice choice. The low angle here as we're kind of on the floor with the hatch, Ash is going to start walking towards it. Gives us a nice geography of where everyone is, while at the same time keeping it uneasy. Close up of him taking the keys out. This becomes another horror movie cliche in that just one little change happens and you're already saying, oh, okay, I guess I buy that, no problem. She's returned to being a human. Maybe this force has kind of left her. Ash doesn't try to listen to the rest of the tapes because he's just caught up in the moment. Later going back, we might ask, why doesn't he just listen to all the tapes? It looks like there's at least two hours of material recorded. So someone else already went through this. Why not listen to that experience and maybe get some kind of knowledge? Great surprise there as the main character puts his head close to the ground and the hands burst out. And he turns around again and his hope for his girlfriend is gone as she's returned to the state of the demon. And then here we have a line that is repeated in the new film, in the remake. As she says, we're going to get you. So he's seeing kind of this nursery rhyme kind of little kid song which makes it all the more uneasy and scary the juxtaposition of kind of an innocent song with the extreme nature of the situation and he takes her out here now again the personality of this demon that's possessing this body very kind of more of a trickster kind of almost immature sort of demon and that it's not attacking ash it doesn't really have like this kind of vicious power. It's just more of like kind of toy with you, play with you, singing like these these little like nursery rhymes. Another shot of the moon and the mist in front of it. It's almost like that kind of became a default image. Again, why doesn't it get darker? <laughs> it's kind of like the sign of hope. This is a really, really great shot. Ash and his dying friend on the couch... Ash pours the water into his mouth at 57 minutes. Makeup here is really great in that it's a little bit over the top, it's a little bit clumsy, and it feels just like it could be a real wound. Sometimes special effects are too clean, and they seem kind of like special effects. Here it's just so kind of messy and grimy, and just we used whatever available material we had to make kind of someone look like they got cut up and attacked it looks over the top that's really kind of what unsettled me watching this as a 13 year old combine that with the tension of the, of the moment anytime there's smoke in the woods the mist that's great she comes in with the knife why does everyone have this knife now if he got attacked by the demon and everyone that attacks is attacked by a demon becomes a demon shouldn't he soon be possessed Here's the moment that will be in the remake, and that it's actually in the Red Band trailer after the credits. As she stabs him, she pulls the knife out, and she licks the blood off of the blade. So what do you do in a remake? You take what was in the original, and you make it smoke some crack, and you take it to the extreme. So in the remake, we're going to get her taking the knife and cutting her tongue down the middle, and then making out with the other girl. It's 2013. We gotta have girls making out, right? And it's scarier and more disturbing if it's a demon girl with a split tongue. I guess.
really hoping that this film is going to be good. Again, not trying to hate on it too early because it does seem like everyone involved wants to make a great film. Oh, we get... <laughs> His girlfriend is stabbed with the special dagger. And she pukes up some milk and crazy blood. So, just the extreme visuals here. The effects pushing it. And just, again, it's unsettling, it's scary, it's disturbing. There's this mix of fear. Fear really is created by the tension. So whenever Ash is in the basement walking around slowly, or there's a quiet moment and a character is looking for someone, that's just a genuine fear. It's a combination of the story of the moment, the sound effects, the believability of the scene, the dynamic of the conflict, and just that slow tension. Love how in the background, the basement demon is just sitting there breathing. Not really saying anything. Just looking creepy. Wow. Really well done. Very unsettling. So we're back to the shed that was previewed early on. We have some nice editing here. Even though the sound effects are a little bit over the top as he kind of locks her in. When he locked her in with those last two... If he kind of just let go, they would kind of fall back down. The first one was a snap lock. The second one was just a hook. And it was like, okay, he hooked it and it snapped. But if he lets it go, it's going to fall back down because it's not kind of really supported by any tension. Here we have a chainsaw without any blades. That would be a risky thing to do, especially if you're on a low-budget film and you're the actress. And they say, well, you know what? Hey, we're going to have someone hold a chainsaw over you so that it's going to seem like he's going to cut you up. And she's saying, how much am I getting paid for this film? And how much experience does everyone have in doing these kind of effects? Notice when they cut to the side view of Ash holding the chainsaw, it was never on and the blades are already stopped. And you could tell that there were no teeth on the chain in the earlier moment. So she's dead and he's going to bury her. This is a scene that will be back in the second film as they make it just about their relationship and the friends are gone. But this is a moment that is, again, extreme, bloody. The education, the wisdom that Raimi and everyone got from those drive-in movies were once it starts to get bloody, once the action, the conflict starts to occur, once the killer is unleashed, keep the pace going. The bloodier, the gorier the faster, the better. This is a really torturous situation for Ash because he's now by himself. And really nice callback here at one hour and two minutes as Ash looks at his girlfriend, she closes her eyes as the demon. So there's obviously manipulation by the demon. It has her memories. And we're getting this call back to when he presented her with the necklace and he was pretending to be asleep. Now she's kind of doing it to toy with him a little bit. These are the moments I'm really hoping are in the remake. And if the remake doesn't incorporate them, it's going to be a little bit of a failure. It's easy for the remake, like the Texas Chainsaw remakes of the last few years, to be glossier, to be sharper, to have a more refined look to it. But what it could be missing is the heart. There's a chance that this Evil Dead remake won't have enough respect for the theme, for the emotion of the characters. It's fine to set them up as a bunch of friends that kind of go to the cabin in the woods and all that. But is there kind of some emotional stake? Is there some kind of pain? I mean, if you go to a place and unleash a demon, whether it's from a Ouija board or from some kind of tape of some guy reciting these spooky incantations. If you're forced to kill the people you love, like in a Walking Dead, whether they're zombies or demons, if you're forced to kill the representation of something that you love, of someone that you love, and they're no longer going to be with you, that's going to take a psychic, emotional mental toll on you. It's going to affect your spirit. What is the point of putting a character through something as torturous as that? 
as character changing as that if they're not going to be altered by it what's the point of going through stressful situations of challenging experiences if those experiences don't alter who you are Oh, 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 that that was that's probably the the most oh man, one hour five minutes, as she comes out of the recently dug grave. That becomes again another horror movie cliche. You think that the character's dead and they keep coming back. She just starts digging into his leg over and over again, and just the blood and the gore. Oh, it's really unsettling because it's a very relatable sort of attack not a lot of us know what it's like to be shot with a machine gun or to have some kind of extreme death but a lot of us have scraped our knee on the sidewalk or maybe a pet of ours kind of scratched us on accident we cut our finger while we were making something to eat we know what like a clawing like a blade kind of pain looks like and that is <laughs> relatable and kind of extreme here we have the scene that'll be inspired for... Oh, man. We have the decapitated head, which obviously is the actress buried in the ground. So props to her for her willingness to do that to make this scene believable. As she's reacting to her body on top of Ash and the neck puking up blood on him, which will be taken in the remake when we have the demon girl puking on one of the characters in all blood. And there's kind of a slightly kind of erotic moment here as well when they cut to the legs of that girlfriend character decapitated on top of him. So there's the mixing of eroticism with the blood and the guts and the violence and the gore and the death. It's just stirring all these really contradictory, intense feelings. This seems like a reshoot going on here at one hour, seven minutes. There's like a zoom kind of forced sort of a perspective blow up of the uh, film quality. So maybe that was a shot that they needed to pick up later after looking at the film that they need to have the hatch closed. This is pure tension. See, now we had kind of the exploitation, blood, extreme nature of this horror gore movie. Now we get into some classic... Fear tactics. This is when you're scared in a movie. Camera behind Ash. He has the gun. And he's slowly walking through the house. Going into the rooms. We have the blinds, the window, the door. Things are moving. And we have that sense that something could pop out. Something could scare him. Ah, oh, there we go. Boom. And even though we're expecting it. It works. It still scares us. And add some music to that as well. And it really adds to the tension. Here we have a low camera angle with the makeup and the character. Now notice the makeup on the character is changing <laughs> a lot. Classic technique here as he's trying to close the door. All of a sudden now it's jammed. So we cut to the close-up of the demon girl with the makeup that again looks different in every scene. But that's cool. We'll just go with it. And then oh, <laughs> just blood again. Anything you hit now kind of has to have a lot of blood coming out of it. So he uses the butt of the gun and he smashes the hand. And there's like this little pellet of blood under it and it spurts everywhere. Ash starts to come into character here. This is basically the first draft writing of the second, third draft 
of what Ash will become in Evil Dead 2 Dead by Dawn. He's been quiet the whole film. Earlier he was kind of having like that Vietnam sort of breakdown, that post-traumatic stress syndrome where he's talking to himself, maybe pretending that people are still alive or thinking that they, they'll come back to life, that this is just like some bad dream and it'll all be over soon. Ash is walking on the leg that was really just shredded. So that's kind of an inconsistency there. You might think that he would be limping a little bit more. These were all pickups done later on where they did the Ash by himself just with Raimi and we have the blood coming out of the pipes. Another nice touch, just pump it up, make it extreme. We have the close-up, kind of the zoom in coming from overhead. The pipe is all sort of bandaged up and for some reason it spurts out <laughs> just buckets of blood. And we have the sockets pouring blood. This, you can kind of say, is like an Amityville Horror inspiration, which was another 70s movie. But just let's just have everything go extreme. We're getting towards the end of the film. Here we have more inspiration for what will happen in Evil Dead 2 as the record player comes to life. And hey, why not? There's also a film projector. That's something that we'll see in Friday the 13th Part 4 with Crispin Glover. So we have just the intensity, the fury, the pace of the film's picking up. The music is building. Ash is just getting punished by the circumstances. And Sam Raimi is a big fan of making his actors feel the pain of his characters. The more exhausted, the more frustrated the actors are, the better the performance is. Depending on the type of situation and character that they're playing, of course. But here... Nice tension as Ash is reloading the gun. You kind of feel like, is he going to load it in time? Maybe he won't. Of course, there's blood on the screen there. Everything is just starting to go haywire. Why not have the light explode with blood? Just starting to really push Ash mentally. Just really starting to force him to kind of break down. Scary situation. We have the close-up in the foreground, Ash in the background here as the pipe is stopped pumping blood out. He steps in the puddle of blood here. Now we're back to tension. We have the exploitation, the intensity of the blood, and we cut back to the slower pace. So Raimi is doing a good job of varying our emotions. It's like in a horror movie especially, the filmmaker, the filmmaking has to be like this sort of composition of ebbs and flows, of peaks and valleys, of making our heart beat, 100 miles a minute, then slowing it down, bringing it back up. Now the clock. Notice the canted angles here. Everything is kind of a little off kilter. Really nice shot there as the room is just crooked and we have the pendulum of the clock swinging. Now it's paused. This kind of is another shot that looks like it might have been picked up later. The quality is a little bit different. And this camera angle is meant to represent the inner state of Ash's mind, the paranoia, the fear really the, this is the most kind of even more than the demon cam this is the most raimi shot of the film right here we're behind ash upside down and we come back over the top in front of him this is really a preview of what raimi is going to be doing in part two look at this now we're just getting non-stop off kilter angles every shot there's nothing that is straight on really good filmmaking because it's reflecting the state of the character. It's really all about what's going on with our character here and it should be different when it comes to how he was at the beginning because it's him by himself, the smoke in the house, the house is starting to be possessed in itself. This is obviously something that is taking to the nth degree in Evil Dead 2. This is a reflection of Ash's mind. Notice how in the beginning of the film it was everybody kind of sharing the main character spotlight. And now as he's become the last person, the lone survivor, this film is also unique in that up to this point, most horror films had female, virginal representations being their survivors. Nice element there in that the mirror is actually water. So more hallucinations, more kind of losing his mind. This is really terrifying stuff. So when it doesn't get bloody, when it doesn't get too extreme, we have another level of fear. 
this is really what good horror movie making is about. Can you scare us just by putting us inside the character's mind, by making us feel the emotions he's going through? Combination of the acting of Bruce Campbell here, you believe that he's scared, with the characters, combine that with the believability and the threat of the opponents, all enhanced by the sound effects, by the score, and then the camera angles. And here we have a great moment as Ash is leaning against the door, talking to himself, something that he's going to do a lot of in the second film. We just stay on him now, the camera angles level, and he's just hearing things all around him. Very inexpensive filmmaking. It's off screen that the fear is being created. Close up here of his hand going in the pocket, pulling out the pendant. So we have an emotional connection. Will there be a representation of some kind of emotional connection in this remake? Or is it just going to be happy giving us a lot of blood? Are we going to give a shit about anybody in the movie? That's the ultimate question. In all these recent remakes, yeah, we get a lot of fresh faces, hotties, new actors, all this kind of stuff. But do we give a about the people? Or are they just cliches like Cabin in the Woods pointed out? Classic fear moment here where as Ash has been against the door, the demon's hands break through and grab him. In 1981, that's a new chill. That's a new thrill. Nowadays, we've seen it done a hundred times before. It's funny that he uh, brings over the little uh, table, and he kind of, table has wheels on it. The shot here of the demon friend popping up in the foreground as Ash was bracing the door, that's taken from the final shot of Within the Woods, where you have the surviving character in the house, on the couch, in the background, thinking she's killed off all the demons. And the character who was possessed last pops up in front and the movie ends there. <laughs> oh, man. Talk about blood, baby. Wow. As the demon friend picks him up, Ash puts his thumbs into his eyes. And just the cheesiest, fakest blood ever pours out of the eyes. And he then he pulls the broken wood out of a wound. And more blood starts pouring out. So we're coming to the end of the film. It's time for the crescendo, the climax. Ash's mission now is to survive and to kill all the demons. And it just is blood city. I mean, there's no holding back. Incrementally, each kill, each demon encounter has become more bloody and more bloody to the point of just the classic blue shirt is just caked in blood. This is the ash we're going to come to know and love in part two, and it sets the stage for what we should expect. If Evil Dead 1 ends on this kind of a note, this is where Evil Dead 2 begins. There's no way you can go backwards and start slow again. And notice the cutting between Ash, our hero, and the threats. We have two opponents... There's the emotional clash within him that these were two friends, but now obviously they're possessed, they're not human anymore. That's not coming across all that strongly. What is becoming apparent now is that the book is on fire a little bit. And again, the fleshy, very unrefined nature of this book has kind of a creepier quality to it than the newer versions of it that are a little more kind of budgeted. The books that have more of a budget kind of look, oh yeah, it's kind of something a little more professional. This is just like, it's supposed to be bound in flesh, right? And it really looks like it's just a uh, unsettling kind of disgusting book here. The demons are starting to smoke because the book is starting to burn. So Ash makes the connection that the way to kill them would be to burn the book. Which isn't really explained because if you say the incantation... Wouldn't it be another incantation that you need to say in order to really close the portal, assuming that it's kind of a portal, let's say there was a force field, and when you say the words, the force field's turned off, when you say abracadabra, it's turned back on. So we'll just go with it, and as the movie ends, I guess we're going to realize that he didn't kill the evil force by burning the book. 
And maybe that's why they kind of rewrote it and remade it in the second film, because you wanted to keep an opening, especially for the idea of going to the medieval dead level of having Ash taken back to 1300 AD. Animation here is really interesting. It's very twisted. We have the book animating. We have everyone's flesh kind of melting off in this very gumby claymation kind of way. And the way that the bodies sort of bubble and fall apart here, obviously they're using some kind of like a food here. There's oatmeal coming out of the sleeve. That's straight up oatmeal. <laughs> it just, uh, anytime any effect like that reminds you of anything that you eat, you're just hitting that initial impactive subconscious reaction. No time to think. You're just making a lightning fast connection to something that you have a memory of. And if it looks like something you eat, it's kind of like, oh, it's even that much more gross. And now the demon hands coming out of the characters, this is kind of like that classic moment of you think that you've killed Michael Myers or Jason, and they're lying there dead on the ground, and now you're going to kind of get close to them and see what's going on. So the demons kind of seem like they died and stopped in motion there as the book burned. But no, they gotta fall apart. We gotta have a couple cockroaches. Let's throw a gardener snake. I guess they didn't have a budget for a huge python or anything. A cobra. But we do have money for, you know, some bugs. Let's go out into the woods and just get some bugs in a box or whatever and capture them and bring them in. And the animation sequence here, it's edited again by the Coen brothers. So a lot of work went into that little sequence. Ash is just caked in blood. Been on the ground the whole time but this is just that gory super blood finale films at this time were starting to push the boundaries like that especially independent films because if you're not released by a major studio it's going to be harder for you to kind of get noticed so you have to build a reputation on a little more shock stand out somehow and this led to the evil dead being recognized by the midnight movie crowd and it started to garner a little bit of reputation and ended up becoming a profitable film. The clock is moving once again. The time is correct. There seems to be sunshine and light outside. The camera is handheld. That's something that hasn't been done much in the film. So the camera angle, the camera style should reflect the emotional state of the character in the moment of the film based on what's going on. It shouldn't be steady cam the whole film because your character is not feeling the emotion of Steadicam the whole time. Even in the most nerve-wracking situations, even if you're fighting in Vietnam, and there's a moment that the bullets stop firing, you're going to be calm. There's times when the firefight's lasting for a day or two, and the sides just keep shooting at each other. You're going to be able to get an hour or two of sleep. Your body adapts, so the camera angles and the choices should adapt to what the characters are going through. Now, there is a moment in the preview for the new film where the girl seems to be the survivor of the movie. So there is a character who is male that has the blue shirt of Ash. But that's just a decoy. The last shot of that film is probably the cabin burning and a female walking away from it. So these new remakes have this formula of let's just reverse the gender of the main character of the original. So, okay, I guess we'll go with that. And now here we have the bookend image. The, it opened with the demon cam, and it closes with the demon cam. We go close up on Ash as he screams. And we are left wondering, okay, what just happened? And how is he going to get out of that situation? I remember watching this, again, I'm 13 years old, just rented both films from the video store. And I probably shouldn't have, but back then, eh, the people behind the counter were like, eh, whatever, it's two bucks, we'll make some money, go, go for it, kid, you don't need your parents' approval. And as soon as this movie ended, I just reached for the case for Evil Dead 2, took out the VHS tape, ejected this movie, and popped the other one in, and couldn't wait to see what was going on. And it was a little confusing for the first 15 minutes, realizing that, oh, okay, they're remaking the first movie, because I had just watched it. And was like, well, I just saw this, but it's kind of different. It's kind of the same. There's the same main character and similar situations, but there's no friends. So what's up with this? Why did they decide to do this and take this kind of direction? But if we take it from the perspective of 
the actual time in between films. Imagine I had seen that in 1981. 1981 VHS tape does exist, and VCRs are starting to become a regular thing in households, but by no means are they a very regular thing. This type of movie, you wouldn't be able to see Evil Dead at your local theater anytime soon. There would be no re-release because it wasn't big enough of a film. So the only way to check it out would be you'd have to go buy it, which at that time it cost like 30 bucks for a VHS tape, and that's a lot of money back in those days. So if you're not going to like a Fangoria's Weekend of Horrors, or you don't know someone who knows someone's maybe at a comic book store who can kind of lend you a copy, you're probably not going to see this movie again. So by having Part 2 be a remake, a very quick remake, of Part 1, it allows for us to kind of know the story of that one, and it allows for Part 2 to be a little bit bigger, because as we saw here, the book was burned. So what do you do in a sequel when Ash is attacked by the demon Cam, and as we see in Part 2, he's spun around and partially possessed. He's like possessed at night, and during the day it's gone. What do you do then? I guess you have the other characters still coming with the pages and the rest of the book you don't need. It's easier to kind of just reboot it, start it over, and take it in a direction that's going to make more sense that'll lead up for the sequel, where at the end of that one he's going back to the Middle Ages. So having to wait six years for this, there probably wasn't the biggest demand for Part 2. Part 2 was made because, again, Raimi was kind of a little bit desperate. He hadn't really had a huge hit after Evil Dead, which was respectable, and was wondering what was going to happen in the future. So we went back to something he was familiar with, and had a lot of fresh ideas, and really got inspired. And this is really Raimi coming into focus. If he's about 20 or 21 when he makes Evil Dead 1, he's 26, 27 when Part 2 is made. And by then, he's seen enough in terms of being on other sets. He's made a movie previous to this, he's produced, he's acted. He's immersed himself in filmmaking for five or six years, so his powers should be stronger than they were five years before. The ideas are all there. There's been two previous drafts, Within the Woods and The Evil Dead, so The Evil Dead 2 should had take all the best ideas from the previous incarnations and add some new ideas and really become something that stands out and is memorable and does just that. It's one of my favorite films of all time, and I think it's still underappreciated for what it represents when it comes to just the joy of filmmaking, the writing of it, and the camera work. It's some of the most inventive just camera work directing that uh, you can find. We will continue the journey through the Evil Dead franchise with Evil Dead 2 Dead by Dawn in the next movie night, but just some final notes here on what to expect from the remake, which is coming out in just a couple weeks. The Evil Dead 1981 has a 100% rating on Rotten Tomatoes. For its time, it really established a new kind of idea in terms of how can you scare people. What would be a story that we really hadn't seen on the screen before? There's a very obscure 1970s film that was actually on Turner Classic Movies a few months back called Equinox. And it roughly is about some professor who finds a book and decodes it. And these kids kind of go in search of him. And they find it, and they unleash some kind of demonic forces. Now, the demons in that film are a little less frightening and much more harmless looking in that they're kind of Ray Harryhausen creations. They just look like creatures from Greek mythology. And it's a very cheesy film in terms of the effects. It's a lot of rear screen projection or just manipulating the foreground and the background. And it's these actors in the desert and... They look up, and there's like a Godzilla kind of creature coming after them. So it isn't really exactly like the Evil Dead in terms of its execution of gore and going to a cabin, but there are the elements there. Now, Raimi has said that the main inspiration for the Necronomicon was his love of H.P. Lovecraft and reading those books, and Lovecraft was the one that invented the Necronomicon. It is a fictional book. Even though growing up watching these films and kind of going to bookstores and seeing a copy of it, it kind of seemed like it was a real thing. But apparently, H.P. Lovecraft invented the whole thing. So Raimi takes that idea from 
Lovecraft and incorporates it here, he had the idea in Within the Woods for the house that's kind of near some possessed burial ground. And while Equinox hasn't really been mentioned, after seeing it, it's really plausible that maybe Campbell or Ramey or Tapper, at some time they saw it somewhere. If it came out in 1970, it would have been eight years before Within the Woods, 11 years before The Evil Dead. So there's a chance that they forgot about it. And it was just in the subconscious and it just kind of came out. It's, it's really close. And if they didn't see it, then it was just the collective unconscious kind of, kind of inspiring them. So if Equinox can be remade, if Within the Woods can be remade, and the original Evil Dead remade into The Evil Dead 2, why not have it be updated today? We live in a time where we always need guidance from our myths, myths of the past. And if it worked 30 years ago, why wouldn't this movie hit us on the same primal level that it did back then? The times have changed because we're not in a horror movie renaissance. It's not a popular genre. What is a popular genre right now, what's a popular, more of a gimmick right now, is the remake, the reboot, the reprofit. Let's just call it that, the reprofit. We are in a reprofit renaissance in that there are people who work for studios and all they do all day is look through IMDb, look through Box Office Mojo and find movies that made a lot of money a long time ago. And if a film made $100 million or $50 million or whatever, if it was a big hit in comparison to its budget, however far back, it probably means it just has like a basic, very relatable good story idea to it and if it can just be taken and tweaked a little bit maybe directly remade and given the same title if it's still recognizable to people who remember it or unofficially remade in kind of a new way but giving a new title and starring someone who's more marketable that's what they're going to do so evil dead while it is a story that tried to capitalize on the popularity of a genre at the same time it was an inspired story it was something that we hadn't seen before these filmmakers had been working the idea for a few years and they decided that now they had enough of it that they wanted to do a good version of it and they wanted to do an even better version of it six years later. The Evil Dead is being remade now because it's profitable to use an old title and to have a pre-existing fan base that can guarantee box office. We are going to see it because we love the franchise, we love Bruce Campbell, Sam Raimi, Sam Raimi's big right now because he just directed the prequel to Wizard of Oz and it's making a ton of money all over the world. So his career is back in full swing after having taken a little bit of a break. And we're going to see it for the nostalgia factors and the curiosity factor. Well, what's a remake going to look like? It's going to look great, but is it going to feel great? It's the same story. It's not going to forget the bloody origins of this film. And it's definitely trying to one-up it. It's trying to improve upon that. So our final question becomes, after The Cabin in the Woods basically said, all of these type of horror movies, these slasher films, these people going off to a remote location and being hunted by something or possessed by something, how can those movies be fresh anymore? How can these cliches be refreshed? And there's the idea of the story cycle, which we didn't get into all the way at the beginning of this commentary, and that a story cycle is basically... An idea emerges, step one, and we respond to it. We like it. Usually it's a creative, just a passionate burst that is manifested by filmmakers who want to make a mark. They have something to prove they're not in the system. Usually these types of films, like a Pulp Fiction, like a Memento, like a Matrix, they come from someone who's not part of the system, and they make an impression because they're so different from the safe, predictable, box office researched ideas that are already out there. So we notice it. We reward it. Now we're hungry for more. We want to see another one. That's where sequels come in. So Hollywood says, okay, let's do a sequel. And those who don't have the rights to that franchise, that idea, they start making the knockoff. So step two is the repetition. And we're still okay with that. We're excited. Most sequels make the same, if not more, money than the originals, and we're good with that. Step three becomes we start to get a little fatigued because American Pie comes out, because Spider-Man comes out, and now all the other studios, all the other filmmakers out there want to cash in on that success, 
There's so many films of this type that are out there that we become overloaded, bored, all the set pieces, all of the characteristics, the qualities of these movies that were new and unique and that we wanted more of, we get overloaded and we become used to them. They lose their power and we start to just kind of feel blasé about it. We're like, ah, okay, I'm kind of over that. We get to step four, which is the idea, the genre, the type of film becomes irrelevant or it becomes kind of a spoof of itself. It becomes played out, super cliches. So now it's time to take those cliches and make a movie out of that. It's time to say, here's all of the popular elements that we thought were so exciting a few years back. We wanted more of them, but now we're tired of them. And now we're going to make fun of them before it dies, before it goes off into retirement. Or you can somehow rejuvenate that. It's become irrelevant and cliche. There's a chance for rejuvenation. So in step four, it has to have kind of a new vital creativity poured back into it. It has to somehow turn itself around by coming up with a new angle on the idea. And this is where Evil Dead 2 comes into the mix in that... By 1987, there had been so many horror films, so many ways that we'd seen characters knocked off and situations and story ideas that it, it was tiring, it was exhausting, it was spoofable. And we thought, well, we're not really going to see anything fresh. And Evil Dead's a great example of taking all the cliches that it helped to start as original ideas, they became cliches, it takes those and it spins them. It makes fun of them while still keeping them a little bit fresh, still reinvigorating them with little tension and doing new and inventive things with them making it exciting so evil dead is an example of a way to rejuvenate a franchise to rejuvenate a genre that's kind of on the way down will the new evil dead be able to do that especially after the cabin in the woods which is comparable to what the evil dead 2 did in 1987 the cabin in the woods is a great example of setting us up with every cliche and then just taking us to a place we did not expect blowing us away. So before watching Evil Dead the remake, it's important to watch all the Evil Dead films within the woods, which is available on YouTube, and also Attack of Hamburger Helper, and then Cabin in the Woods, because you need to know what's come before. That's the story cycle. Going into the new Evil Dead, we have to ask, is it just going to be the same story, new actors, glossier look, and a ton of blood, just a little more hardcore, saw, hostile, really like a Rob Zombie, just over the top kind of super blood version. Is that going to qualify as new? Or is there something that's even going to be more inventive there? I'm hoping for the more inventive Cabin in the Woods, Evil Dead 2 kind of angle without being comedic. Can it be scary? Can it return to fear? Is a lot of blood? Is a lot of gore? Is someone puking a blood or a tongue being sliced? Is that scary? Or do we just want extreme stimulus? These are questions we need to ask ourselves. Why are we going to reward Evil Dead? Because Raimi and Campbell are behind it? Because they, it has their stamp of approval? Because we want more blood? Because we just love the franchise and we're curious what's done with it? I'm hoping it's a great film. Sequels are not bad. Reboots and remakes are not bad if they have genuine passion creating them. But if they're just a very slick cash-in, and I'm not excited about the over-the-top tagline on the poster, that's just way too cocky for its own good, and it's just a over-the-top marketing gimmick, the most terrifying film you will ever see. You could say it might be the bloodiest, but anytime you use anything ever, come on, are you serious? So give yourself the experience of going through the Evil Dead franchise, going through Cabin in the Woods, and the short films that helped to inspire the franchise so that you go in with the best possible knowledge base, experience base, and you can kind of say, hey, this is what it's doing, this is what it wants to do, did it succeed, why do I like it? This remake has a lot of work to do because as we just saw and experienced, the original still holds up after 30 years. What are your thoughts about this new version? Is it just an easy payday or is it trying to do something new? Are you planning to see it? Please share your thoughts in the comments section. Now since we just watched the first film, why not do a movie night for the entire trilogy? So make sure to subscribe and follow me because you can expect the Evil Dead 2 Dead by Dawn movie night sometime at the end of April. We'll conclude with Army of Darkness sometime in June. Until next time, remember, we get more of what we pay for, so if we don't want let's not watch 
And as always, long live good movies.